Welcome to LFPL's At the Library series, an ongoing podcast featuring author talks, programs, and events at the Louisville Free Public Library. For more information about upcoming events, visit us online at www.lfpl.org forward slash upcoming events dot htm. Please welcome Dr. Calvin Coker. Good evening. Uh, it's very good to see everyone, and I'm glad uh, that some folks were able to make this for the first time. I hope that this will not be uh, incredibly disorienting for you. I hope that there will be some amount of recap, and fortunately, much of what we have previously talked about informs what we're going to talk about tonight, but it is not crucial. It's not required background reading. There will not be a quiz. Um, I want to make sure that everybody is a little bit on the same page before we start talking about emotion in argument both our own and our conversation partners. And I think that a recap is a good way to do that. Two weeks prior, we talked a little bit about political polarization and how argument has become significantly more difficult for a bunch of reasons that are outside of our control. That's not in your head. I know that argument is typically hard, right? It's a charged interpersonal thing. There are stakes attached to it. Like there are people who like to argue, but normally you can identify them and then avoid them in your workplace. (laughs) Like this is not the kind of thing necessarily that we actively seek out. And that has been made more complicated by the way that political partisanship tends to work in American politics. Now, I don't know if your head is on politics right now with the New Hampshire primary firing and all of that, but fortunately, we are able to understand argument and polarization, not just as political phenomena, but as things which trickle down into our like general attitudes in everyday life. And it is in that way that we can understand what we talked about last week, which was getting to good faith argument. I've got another slide that's going to actually like remind us what good faith argument is. Uh, so don't worry if you've forgotten or if you did not know prior, Uh, but suffice to say, we get in our own way quite a bit. Even in circumstances where we actively want to do the right thing, where we want to engage in a productive conversation, when we want, simply put, to have the argument, not to win, but because it's an argument that needs to happen, periodically, we are going to falter. And one of the reasons that we falter is actually the topic tonight, which is not just that emotions can get in the way of argument. That's probably a presupposition that folks have coming into a night like this. It is that we don't actually know how to deal with emotion and argument. And I don't mean deal in the sense of dispatch it, put it away, quarantine it, squish the feelings down. I instead mean that when emotion comes up in argument, we very often are navigating a gray space in terms of, is this acceptable expression of emotion? How is it germane to the argument? Am I being manipulated? Because it's possible that you have been told that emotions in argument constitute manipulation or constitute an illogical fallacy of some kind, meaning that an appeal to emotion does not have a place. It is an impure form of argument. I disagree, and we'll talk about that tonight. Uh, Next week, we will talk about structures that make arguments significantly harder. Uh, We will specifically be focusing on things like gender and race, and you will be getting a preview of the gender conversation, I think, tonight, because it is essentially impossible for us to talk about the role of emotionality without also talking about how that particular term has a gendered valence in American politics, society, culture, all manner of things. So the recap of good faith argument, kind of what we are trying to navigate towards and what we're trying to encourage in others. As a reminder, the Cato Institute characterizes good faith argument as featuring both parties in having these characteristics, agreeing to the terms on which they engage, that can be varied and multiplied, but both parties really need to Uh, approve. They are honest and respectful of the other person's dignity. They are following generally accepted norms of social interaction, meaning that there is room for deviation or room for violation, especially if both parties have largely agreed upon those violations as being acceptable. And finally, the thing which typically is very, very hard for us is that you genuinely want to hear what the opposing side has to say. A through line 
of this course and a through line of any conversation on productive argument presupposes that when you are engaging someone, you need to at least have some degree of investment or interest in what it is they have to say. Now, that sounds kind of obvious, right? Nobody wants to have a conversation where they're just waiting for their turn to talk. And it's obviously crucial in the context of argument because you want to be responsive. If somebody is talking about why they believe a particular thing and you believe that they are mistaken, and it's relevant to your argument that you demonstrate that they are mistaken, there's a logic of interaction between what they've said and what you're going to say. So it's not just that you need to listen to folks because it's important that your conversation partner be heard, and that will actually, I think, stem off some of the broader problems, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. It is also that there is an argumentative utility to listening to one's opponent, and that is something that we need to keep in mind. But, as previously mentioned, and this is a recap, we get in our own way. Very often we make assumptions about our partner's intentions, and those assumptions can stem from all manner of things. Maybe we have a history with this person. Maybe this person has outwardly flagged things that would encourage us to make assumptions, things like their political beliefs, or maybe their attitudes on particular social characteristics, maybe things like their religiosity or the nature of their upbringing. We make assumptions because Oftentimes, those are reasonable things that we can do. But that gets in the way, very often, of arguments, because you cannot ask a Democrat or a Republican why they believe such a thing and then essentially ignore the answer. We can make assumptions, but those assumptions come through the lens of partisanship. And if partisanship is giving us cues that the other team is bad in some capacity, we're going to make assumptions about motivations that are probably inaccurate. We also know that we oftentimes fail to respect why someone would have the idea that they have. You all are mistaken about something. I am too. Like, we all have ideas that are perhaps erroneous or a little bit incorrect. And at times, we fail to realize that the incorrect nature of our belief is not actually, like, a deficit, it's not a problem, it's not a character flaw, it's actually an opportunity to rectify a conversation because we can learn more. But sometimes people come to conclusions genuinely, even if they're a conclusion that is fundamentally unintelligible to you. There are conclusions that have been drawn about United States politics or about voting behavior or about all manner of things that to me are unintelligible. I don't understand how you actually square that circle and how you come to the conclusion that you did. But if I come into an argumentative encounter with that perspective of, I need you to square this circle for me, that is going to put people on the back foot. It's going to put them on the defensive, and it's going to create an adversarial frame that will prevent argument from happening effectively. There are also moments where we violate the terms of engagement almost preemptively. We all have that member of our household or our extended family who you know when you talk to them, it's gonna be a fight. And sometimes the temptation is to just dial it up to 11. You just, you gird your loins and you're ready to go. Like, all right, we're gonna have a fight, we're doing it. There's like an understandable defensiveness and an understandable, there's like, we get why people would adopt those tactics. But if you start at 11, there's very rarely an opportunity for people to dial it back. You can always, always escalate, but de-escalation is significantly harder. And as such, if we begin an encounter in a way that's a little bit dysregulated, it's going to be really hard for us personally to recover from that, and frankly, for other people to engage us. And finally, very often, we're simply not interested in what the other party has to say. We identify even the good reasons that they have their perspective, and we say to ourselves, yeah, that's not good enough. That's not raising to the level that I arbitrarily have decided is appropriate, and as such, there is no way that I'm going to be able to engage you seriously on this debate. That's obviously not charitable, obviously not reasonable, and very often it presupposes that whatever the other person has to say is probably something that we've heard before, and it's probably something that we don't need to entertain, which is obviously not the case. If we are trying to navigate towards good faith argumentation, we know that we all have tendencies that are going to make it so that that is harder. 
And I would argue that one of the things that makes it significantly harder is that we do not teach very often adults or children in the United States emotional regulation. And that regulation is actually crucial for the navigation of argument. So the animating question this evening, the thing which is uh, a, an attempt, I think, to get at this very complicated but big topic, is what role, if any, do emotions actually have in productive good faith argument? Now, this question is double-barreled, because I'm asking about your emotions. What role do your emotions have in argument? Should you be bracketing them? D does it mean I'm being objective if I try to keep my emotions out of the conversation? And the converse, if I am putting my emotions in the conversation, does that mean I'm at a deficit? I'm at a disadvantage? Or that I'm somehow doing something untoward or inappropriate? That's the first part. But the second is when other people are emotionally dysregulated, or they're engaged in an importation of emotion into the argument encounter that we did not consent to, we, we did not find predictable, and frankly, it kind of raises our heckles, it activates stress responses. We need to figure out how we're supposed to navigate that aside from just simply shutting down the conversation. And as such, tonight we're really talking about two things, which is first, how did we get a demonization of emotion going. That's actually not like a normal contention, right? That has a social and a cultural and a political history, and I'm not gonna bore you with all of the books and talk about the Enlightenment and all of that, but we are gonna make reference to it, and then we will actually talk programmatically about what would it mean to include argument and emotion together, and how could we do so productively? So the beginning of the conversation concerns emotion and rationality. I think a vast majority of folks have been told or have some sort of vague recollection of emotions as being in opposition to rationality. And Connor Friedersdorf, who is a writer for The Atlantic, actually hosted a debate about the nature of rationality. And one of the opening salvos was this statement. So much of the structure and animating ideals of Western democracy are based on the idea of reason and rationality. The Enlightenment ideal that man Sick there is a representation of the fact that it should be human. Man is not a stand-in for humans, uh, but that's neither here nor there. Is rational and thus capable of self-governance. Now, a question that I would often pose to my students is, what is it about emotion that is somehow opposed to self-governance? Because you all, I assume, have some degree of self-governance in your life. You make decisions, you pay bills, you pay taxes, I hope you do. Uh, you make sure that things are functioning, that the trains run on time in some capacity. But you still experience emotions. And your experience of those emotions, maybe you function by quarantining them, but it's clear that emotions aren't necessarily opposed to our everyday functioning. So what is the nature of the argument that Friedersdorf is making? Well, it's that rationality concerns arguably, and this is like the Enlightenment ideal, I don't necessarily agree with it, but this is the argument, it concerns universal or largely agreed upon contentions, whereas emotions are almost always contextual and idiosyncratic. And what I mean by that is that there are things that we can agree upon, right? I think that most folks would agree upon basic mathematical or biological principles. Two plus two equals four. Human beings are mammals. These things are largely agreed upon. And it doesn't necessarily matter if we have like an emotional response to that. It, it kind of continues to be some version of reality, right? Compare this to our emotional realities. There are some folks who can experience grief and loss that is profound, that is deep, that is unfathomable to folks, and they will not outwardly express emotion in the same way that we would. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're not experiencing grief in the same way that we would, but we also know that grief is tricky. We know, generally, that our emotional responses are, yes, socially conditioned, but the proportion, the acceptability of particular kinds of engagement, those things kind of depend on the individual. And if you're basing decisions off of what people can largely agree upon, it seems as though we can't largely agree upon, well, what constitutes an acceptable expression of remorse 
or an acceptable expression of grief, or hell, an acceptable expression of anger. It's difficult to pin down what precisely that looks like, and in that way, rationality arguably is opposed to it. Emotion also, when you broadly construe it, it can mislead people. At least this is the argument for uh, like the logical fallacy kind of side of emotional appeals. It suggests that if we lead with our heart instead of our head, we're going to make decisions that we would not otherwise make. I think that that is true, but I would argue it's a feature, not a bug. In a circumstance in which we allow emotions to guide our decisions, though, we may actually be offering ourselves up to something that is fundamentally capricious, a little bit unpredictable. There are times where people are going to encourage you to sleep on a decision or to revisit something a little bit later. And by gosh, when you actually do that, yeah, okay, the decision calculus is a little bit different because our bodily sensations, hunger, anger, sadness, depression, these things all have the ability to warp other cognitive functions or at the very least exercise perhaps a disproportionate impact. This is one of the reasons that we perceive emotions to be in opposition to rationality. And also, something that we haven't talked very much about is civility as a construct. And one of the reasons I don't like talking about it is it is a sticky wicket. There is no stable definition of civility that I think we would all agree on, aside from treat other people like human beings. Uh, and frankly, we probably don't even agree on the content of that treatment. And as such, Invocations of civility should always raise an eyebrow, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But specifically, the importation of emotion, sadness, remorse, appeals to emotion, or even entirely justifiable anger, that may be understood as a violation of a social contract or a violation of our expectations going into an argument and encounter. And when people violate social expectations of an argument and encounter, we oftentimes use civility as a justification for why we would shut something down. Now, I would argue that none of these things are entirely true, but there are things that have encouraged us to believe that emotion and rationality are somehow in opposition to each other. Now, I've isolated four and we'll unpack probably two of them, the two, in my opinion, most relevant. The first, obviously, are these Enlightenment ideals of the nature of truth. The Enlightenment as a philosophical period was very concerned with objective reality, a reality that was describable and discoverable by human beings and was not in any way contextually defined or constructed by human beings. That would obviously crowd out emotion. We kind of talked about that. The second is folks like Ben Shapiro, contemporary partisan actors who use as a justification for a particular style of debate the argument that facts don't care about your feelings. Now, that is true. Like, no matter how upsetting to me the, you know, the quadratic formula is, it's not going to change or something like that. But there are plenty of circumstances in which the way that we interpret or the way that we understand facts ought to actually be colored by uh, feelings feel so dismissive. But yes, feelings. Like there are statistics, for example, which ought to govern or structure our approaches to the world. How many deaths are acceptable, right? That actually is in many ways an emotional question. How much human suffering am I willing to tolerate in the pursuit of this policy? Human suffering, when it's not happening to me, still bothers me. Like, I think that's true for a vast majority of folks. So there are moments in which facts don't care about your feelings really doesn't respond to the importance of emotion, and yet that is very much like Shapiro specifically, but generally the kind of provocateur framework of I'm just saying the truth and the truth is unpopular. And when you get upset, it's largely because you're just not willing to face the truth. Again, I think that this is not exactly true, but it is very much, I think, a common discourse amongst a specific subset. The third is that at times we insist on forms of civility which are not actually tenable. I don't know if you've ever been engaged in a conversation with a person who is above you in the hierarchy. I'm thinking about a manager or a professor, uh, maybe a faith leader, or perhaps even just a parent. And that person may be a little bit preoccupied 
with the tone or the engagement of the conversation. And sometimes that is warranted. If a person comes in hot, maybe we do need to take a step back. But there are moments in which, specifically in circumstances of hierarchy, civility is a way of maintaining the status quo, and it's a way of maintaining the position of those in power in some capacity. So when protesters' anger or a rejection, a sometimes semi-violent rejection of the status quo is viewed. We sometimes look at that not as the content of pain or the content of genuine frustration and attempt to take into one's own hands extra parliamentary means of change, but instead as a simple violation of civility, a violation of decorum, which very often is a way of shutting down the conversation. Finally, Emotion is gendered, and it's racialized in the way specifically that we mobilize it in argument. Now, this may not ring true for you. You may think to yourself, no, of course, everybody can have emotions, and everybody can be overly emotional in an argument. That is true. However, who gets policed in the context of an argument? Who gets regulated out? Whose emotions are acceptable to portray, and whose emotions maybe get shifted to the wayside, or not viewed as an appropriate or an acceptable way of being. There is a good argument to be made that the Enlightenment focus on rationality and truth, that actually does, in some way, have to do with conversations on gender. Because there is robust evidence to suggest that historical documents that treat, for example, man as a stand-in for humanity, they actually were talking about men. They identified women as something fundamentally different. This has occurred, according to Amy Korber, in a vast majority of medical texts, which treat the female body as an imperfect version of the male body. Obviously not what it is, and yet if that is institutionalized, if that is a prevailing assumption that occurs within a field, it's well within the realm of possibility that additional dichotomies would be mapped on to gender relations. And that is very much the case in the context of, I would say, emotion and argument. And I mentioned that it has a racial dimension as well. And I think we very much can see this in pretty much contemporary memory, where conversations about, say, police brutality are not actually about police brutality or police excessive use of force, but they are instead about the decorum of the people who are objecting to particular occurrences. Now, it's fine and good to say we cannot have a debate while that target is on fire. Reasonable. Like, yes, okay, I'm with you. However, in circumstances in which the palpability of anger is like shunted to the wayside. It's like essentially saying, hey, listen, as a community, I understand that you are fed up with being over-policed or you're fed up with particular kinds of violence being enacted against you. But can't we just come to the table and have a rational conversation? That's quite the standard, honestly. That's quite the expectation that we would place on a conversation partner. And in some ways, the negation of emotion is actually a negation of a person's dignity. How realistically could you expect a trans individual to argue with you about the nature of being trans and not get a little bit emotional? That is, that is their very being. That is their very self. You're not talking about tax policy. You're talking about a living, breathing human being. And as such, in circumstances where these debates actually do like matter for people, of course we're going to have circumstances where emotion matters. It is present in an argument, and it's not going to go away. So we probably shouldn't try to regulate it out. A couple of thoughts specifically on civility and then the question of emotional regulation. First, when we think about argument, we know that emotion is very often regulated. It becomes something that we attempt to limit rather than experience or sit with or allow to inform parts of an argument. If we treat emotion as opposed to rationality, we're not going to have emotional appeals. We won't have people attempting to contextualize, say, human suffering or something along those lines. There are also moments in which emotion is regulated in a lopsided way, where some folks are allowed to be angry. Some folks are allowed to present an emotional version of the argument, and other folks are not. 
I always think it's amusing when uh, TV pundits, talk show hosts and all of that, are like clearly engaged in their rigmarole, their normal performance. It's up, it's above, it's, it's very much extra. And then suddenly a guest begins to push back and they cut their mic. It's like, oh no, we, we can't have that nonsense here. Well, listen, Tucker Carlson and folks like him, there are moments in which we are performing emotion. And very often, it doesn't matter the side. It doesn't matter if it's Tucker Carlson or Rachel Maddow or Chris Hayes or whoever. There is a performance of outrage. And we talked about that last week, where the performance of outrage is just that. It's very often a way to generate clicks. But it also has to do with who gets to express emotion. There are moments in which some of the most visible, angriest people are actually giving us a template of who gets to be angry. Compare this to the dearth, comparatively, of, say, angry black folks in the public eye. There was a skit at the, uh, pre the Correspondence Dinner in 2015 called An Anger Translator, where Barack Obama had, uh, I think it was Michael Keegan Key, uh, as an anger translator, essentially expressing outward anger that you imagine the president had felt, but wasn't able to actually bring to bear. The whole conceit of that shtick is that it is impossible for, specifically, a high-ranking black official to be angry in the same way that a high-ranking white or a high-ranking female official could be. Now, these are idiosyncrasies, right? Like, I'm not trying to cherry-pick examples and say this is the way it is. But we have plenty of anecdotal evidence, plenty of statistical evidence, plenty of evidence from both psychologists and political scientists which suggest that when we are dealing with emotion, we have a tendency of discounting it. And that discounting may oftentimes have to do with things like gender and race. It does also have to do with a preoccupation with I think, biological differences. This notion that women and men actually experience emotions differently. I, this is a moment where there is a robust body of debate on this, but I can bring to you conclusions. There is very limited evidence to suggest that there is actually a difference in the way that biological males and biological females experience the intensity, frequency, or intellectual dominance of emotion. Rather, socialization very likely accounts for outward expressions of emotions and their difference. King and Gordon suggest that, yes, women do exhibit more emotion, but there is nothing to suggest that they are actually experiencing emotion with a greater intensity or a greater like impact on their cognitive functioning than anybody else. And a follow-up study from Jantz suggested that men tend to exhibit what is called restrictive emotionality, which is very often understood as a social technique. Men in the United States experience emotion, but their capacity to express it is very often circumscribed. It's not that men can't be emotional. It's that there's very specific ways that men get to be emotional. Have you ever seen Daniel Day-Lewis in a movie? That's the emotion that you're able to portray. You're able to be angry, you're able to cry, but these things very often have to relate to injustice or difficulty. It is not instead the intensity of emotion that all human beings tend to experience. And there is also a very vulgar tendency where in an attempt to, I think, jostle for position in an argument, when specifically a woman is voicing some form of complaint or objection, there is a lopsided or sometimes overt explanation of the complaint, not as a genuine thing, but as a reflection of hormonal imbalances. Something that has to do, for example, with them being on their monthly cycle. Couple of things. First, men actually experience a monthly cycle as well. Hormones fluctuate in pretty much all human beings. If they don't fluctuate, you actually might have a little bit of a problem in some ways. And there is a, a large amount of evidence to suggest that men experiencing hormonal fluctuations experience not only bodily differences, but also cognitive distance, or differences in terms of the intensity of emotions that they're ultimately able to encounter. This is not to say 
that we should be able to levy the charge of you're too emotional at everyone. That's not actually the point here. It is merely to say that very often there is no evidence for this notion or very minimal evidence for this notion that women somehow experience emotion differently. And yet they are regulated differently in the context of argument encounters because women are very often concerned with having that that little thing be brought up of, yes, I know you have a valid concern, but have you considered that the validity of that, the validity of that concern is tempered by your biological processes or something like that? That's in the back of many women's minds. And as a cis male, that's virtually never in the back of my mind. My concern, yes, is sometimes I may like come in too hot or something like that, but I'm not thinking that somebody is going to blame my very biology for it. That obviously creates a problem. And even if it never gets mobilized, if you've literally never encountered a version of that argument in the wild, it still probably is in the back of your mind as a survival tactic that you have to keep in mind as a female in some capacity. Ultimately, if there's not very much truth to there being emotional differences between biological sexes, we need to ask ourselves, well, why would we be regulating emotion differently along gendered lines? And also, why precisely would we be regulating emotion when it's clearly experienced by everyone? And the answer to that question oftentimes has to do with social rules concerning things like decorum. And civility is a good example of that decorum. But we need to actually acknowledge that when we have emotions, things like civility, things like good faith argument, they may not necessarily capture the substance of that. We need three things. First, to recognize that emotions are definitely valid as part of an argument, but that doesn't mean that there aren't social stakes and regulations which eventually concern their expression. There are people and circumstances in which you can be angry, you can be outwardly expressive of emotion. And there are other circumstances in which that may be more heavily regulated. If you're able to understand those circumstances, is this person or group of people a person or group that I am safe to emote in front of, safe being variously defined, that's an important first question to determine, well, how am I actually supposed to govern my behavior? And this is true even in circumstances where we cannot deny that emotion matters in the context of an argument. Because sometimes, even if emotion matters, its expression is going to uh, invite some form of social censure. And I would also encourage you to remember that if your emotional expression appears to be valid, like there is a justifiable reason that it's been brought into the conversation, and another person is working to exclude it, you should probably ask them why. Encourage them to defend the exclusion of your particular emotions. Because if you're having a conversation with someone and it gets a little bit heated, there's probably a reason for that. And it's possible that by somebody taking a step back and saying, hey, this is getting a little bit heated and that's making me uncomfortable, it makes sense to ask, why? What is it about my emotional response here that is activating discomfort for you? And I don't mean why in the adversarial sense. I don't mean why as, well, justify yourself. I mean genuinely attempting to identify what is it about my emotional expression that appears to be incompatible with this argument that you are attempting to make. And that standard is very difficult for people to meet. Now, at times, a raised voice or like, you know, somebody crying or something along those lines, that may make it so that the argument needs to pause. Because if somebody raises their voice, the other person is put into an interesting position. They can meet that, they can maintain a sort of cool and level head, but it's possible that that other person's building up a head full of steam. So how do we end up cutting that off? And one of the ways I think that we end up cutting it off is by thinking about civility, which is emoting in an argument, being viewed as less than decorous. Very often when people are uncomfortable with the emotional expression that occurs with an argument, they say, well, okay, we need to keep this civil. We need to keep this contained. We need to keep this under control. Martin Luther King Jr. made an argument that the fear that he had was not actually about the Ku Klux Klan. They were telling people who they were at every given moment. It was the white moderate. 
the white moderate who is more invested in stability and the status quo than in justice. There are plenty of circumstances in which calling for civility does not have those same stakes. But there are moments in which when people call for civility, they're actually just attempting to exclude emotions, particular kinds of evidence, or even particular kinds of people from the broader conversation. If someone is asking you for civility, and very often they're doing so in response to a particular uh, emotional topic or emotional outburst, you need to ask a series of productive questions of yourself or of your conversation partner. First, what about this presentation of emotion is actually disrespectful or disruptive? I have a tendency, for example, of cursing. I curse like a sailor. Uh, and you know, maybe it's not befitting of my profession or whatever, but that's just the way that I tend to communicate. And yet, there are moments where I know that if I casually, excuse me, if I casually begin cursing in a conversation, somebody's heckles might get raised. Because sometimes cursing is like this entirely normal, banal form of human communication. And other times it's reserved very specifically for times of crisis or times of frustration. And as such, I may be giving a verbal cue, which is not actually about like, it's not truly a signal of frustration or danger, but people could understandably sense it that way and then ask for civility. There are also circumstances in which we should ask when civil discourse is being talked about, how are they being predictably applied? Put differently, is everybody holding themselves to the same standard? Because there are plenty of moments in which you can have a civil conversation that meets all of the like standards of decorum, and yet it is a conversation that is abhorrent in some capacity. Um, I, I don't mean to open a can of worms. I don't know if you feel like Louisville is more Midwestern or Southern, but I grew up in the Midwest, and as such, I know about Midwest nice. People who are polite and can tell you things that match social decorum and yet are not fundamentally kind. Do not fundamentally actually afford dignity to the person who's being uh, talked with. And as such, when people are invoking a regulation of emotion under the name of civility, you need to ask, is this a universal standard? Is it being predictably applied to everyone, including yourself in some ways? And finally, when parties are calling for civility, how might their position be impacted if we weren't being civil? There are circumstances in which a lack of civility, as indexed by uh, an explanation of emotion, will actually underline the stakes. It'll underline the importance of a particular occurrence or an event, and it will create a scenario where a, real, a reasonable person cannot look at that argument and still double down on whatever it is they were attempting to do. This is not because that person is soft-hearted, it's because that person is probably human. And very often, emotional appeals actually clarify elements of humanity. So when people are calling for civility, because there's a use of emotional appeals or something along those lines, we have to ask, to what end? Is it because you don't want to enact the change that we are asking for? Because if that's the case, if civility is being invoked as a way to create an escape hatch for the argument, that is fundamentally not productive or engaging in good faith. I'm not telling you to not be civil, but I am telling you to be skeptical when people are conflating civility with like not expressing emotion in any capacity. This has been a big lead up, arguably, to a conversation about, well, what role does emotion have in argument? Because up until this point, yes, there have been strategies, there have been thoughts about like, okay, it's, it's all defensive. How do I make sure if I am being emotional that that's not going to get regulated out in some capacity? But I would argue that emotion can actually be effective in the context of argument. And I don't mean effective in like the manipulative sense, learn how to win friends and influence people. I mean genuinely, emotion in argument can do things that a pure invocation of logic or facts or appeals to credibility, the old logos, ethos, pathos business, it's not going to get the job done in the way that an emotional appeal very might, uh, very might actually do that. So emotions, I would argue, are fundamentally logical, and as such, they have a place in argument. When we talk about an emotion being illogical, we're actually not really talking about the emotion. 
we're talking about the proportion of the response. I feel like I've mentioned this in past classes, so forgive me, but I have a four-year-old daughter, and a toddler is a great demonstration of how things can actually have like a root cause. They can be rational in that way. You can draw a line between point A and point B and say, this is what inspired the behavior. But it might be profoundly disproportionate. And in that way, it is illogical. My daughter does not need to have a full-blown meltdown because we ask her to put socks on. Like that, that's, no, that's disproportionate. But it's not illogical because there is actually an internal logic that she was going through that justified her particular like behavior and not wanting to be interrupted to have to put socks on. This is true for a vast majority of our emotions. When you are sad, that's not illogical. It's actually a reasonable response to some form of stimuli. And I think we oftentimes put ourselves in trouble when we start attempting to arbitrarily limit, well, how sad is too sad kind of thing. A very good friend of mine just recently had to put down their dog of 13 years. This was a great dog, and that dog structured this person's life. And less than two weeks after the event, this person was apologizing to me and saying, yeah, I just, I feel like I'm really not together. I still feel sad. It's like, you, you lost a, a member of your family, essentially. Like, maybe you don't feel that way about animals, but if there's an entity in your life that has existed and been a stalwart for 13 years and then it goes away, it would actually be reasonable to mourn that loss. And I'm not even thinking... Uh, just about dogs here. There are folks who will mourn the loss of an automobile or of a home or something like that. These are inanimate objects. Why would they be inspiring emotions? Well, it's actually pretty logical at the end of the day because our attachment to things is real, it is manifest, and it does structure our actions. Similarly, anger is very often an entirely reasonable response, although at times it can be disproportionate. I'm sure you have people who are illogically angry in your life. And in reality, they're probably angry about something that is discernible, defensible. Yes, of course, I would be angry about that too. But maybe their response is fundamentally disproportionate, and therein lies the problem. But things like happiness and joy, they're also, even though they are ineffable, they're difficult for us to quantify, they're traceable, and they are understandable within their contexts. We won't talk much about it tonight, but there is also something called affect, which is the precognitive intensity that we attach to places or people or ideas, and those actually still function within their own internal logic. It's the same principle of getting chills when you step into a location for the first time after an extended absence. There is a feeling that is attached to that location. And even though that feeling is not perhaps universal, not everybody experiences it in the same way, it's still traceable, it's voiceable, it's identifiable, and as such, the baggage or the difficulty that may come with emotion and argument, it can be activated by those same things. If we assume that emotion is logical, it can clearly have a space in argument, even those that are prioritizing things like fact, logic, and rationality. And there are a couple of reasons why. First, emotion is a pathway to empathy. And empathy is not, I would argue, fundamentally manipulative. It's actually an articulation of the stakes. When we talk, for example, about like United States border security, and when we talk about things like immigration, we could talk about the nature of the policies, right? We could also talk about the people who are being impacted by those policies. You could pick really any possible political topic in America and talk about it in abstractions, or you could talk about it in terms of people in a lot of ways. Now, some would characterize that as emotional, but I would characterize it as an articulation of the stakes. If we put barbed wire on the border, what human impact does that have? And, and I mean that specifically in terms of who is going to get injured. How many people are actually going to uh, experience some form of harm as a consequence of this policy? Now, that experience of harm is perhaps not enough to justify shifting the policy. And that's totally reasonable. However, if in a circumstance like that, the insistence is that we exclude emotional calculus because we shouldn't be making those decisions based off of how it would impact people, that is an assessment of politics that I fundamentally disagree with. Politicians and legislation should be responsive to the people who it impacts. Second, 
anger is actually a justifiable response to some precipitating events or causes. Now, I'm not telling you blind rage is appropriate, right? Because like we've all had that moment where we are so very angry that it's not realistic that we're going to get talked down <laughs> or something like that. I'm not saying that that's justifiable and you should bring that into an argument encounter. I'm instead saying that there are moments in which a person's actions or an entity's actions or simply the occurrences of the universe should be enough to inspire anger. And frankly, that anger cannot always be bracketed before going into a circumstance. Not to continue to use such charged topics, but it is entirely unreasonable to expect a trans individual or a minoritized individual who has suffered or had their community suffer at the hands of police to entirely bracket those things when they're having a conversation about policies regarding bathrooms or reforming the police. That anger is intense. It is felt. In some instances, it has organized entire ways of being. And to insist that an argument exclusively should function as logic is fundamentally exclusive of those individuals and places an impossible burden on them. And also at the bottom, Emotion can shatter the abstractions that we deal with in terms of argument. And there are times in which emotional appeals actually clarify how those abstractions are fundamentally damaging to us. This is a moment where, again, I'm not trying to like tell you how to think about abortion politics, but the decision in Dobbs v. Jackson, the justification by the majority was an abstract legal exercise. It was making an argument about originalism. It was making an argument about the nature of states' ability to regulate. It was making an argument about the Constitution. Now, I'm not saying that I don't care about what the Constitution says, and I don't think that anybody in here would not care about it. But if you have an entire court document that overturns Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey, and you're not talking about the possible human impact of that overturn, we need to ask what's going on. Now, it's more than possible that this is consonant with your politics. You fundamentally believe that Roe and Casey were poorly decided, they were stains on legal history, and as such, Dobbs represents a justified uh, rectification of that. However, I need you to be able to have that idea while also acknowledging that there is a genuine human cost. And yeah, that may feel like an emotional or uh, abstract appeal, and yet, it does clarify that there were stakes attached to an abstract legal exercise. There is a justifiable critique of really people in the ivory tower, people like me, who abstract things so far that it fails to consider that they are real people. A psychology class or philosophy class trying to develop as an intellectual exercise a justification for genocide. I don't know why you would do that. I genuinely don't, but that is definitely something that has occurred under the auspice of logic or rationality. That is pretty horrifying. It's a bad thing. And I don't say that, that it's a bad thing because, just because it could damage folks. I say it because that is fundamentally encouraging us to not understand argument as something that impacts people, but instead as understanding it as a game. The kind of thing that people can maneuver their way into a winning position and damn be the consequences. That is incredibly bad. And as such, we need to think very seriously about how emotion can continue to function in argument. And I think it's very much about the insertion or the understanding of empathy and the articulation of stakes. Now, we have about 35 minutes left, which is exactly where we want to be, because I want to talk a little bit about concrete steps, the exact things that we are supposed to do, not only in terms of our own emotions, but also in terms of the emotions of others. This is a repeat slide, I'm saying it every week, and that is that these are some strategies which may work. They may be effective. Unfortunately, because argument is so contextual, it is so individually defined, there may be moments in which this doesn't work. There's no cure-all. There's no uniform effect. However, that does not mean that we ought to not try. And finally, I would encourage you to remember that not every problem is going to be solvable with argument or with these strategies. There will be people who, despite your best efforts, are still going to yell and scream and make an argument untenable. 
That is a moment in which they are bringing a version of emotion into it, and it is absolutely opposed to productive good faith argument. I'm not asking you to tolerate that. I'm merely saying that in a vast majority of instances, we can actually probably shape an argumentative encounter a little bit more, not just to our favor, but also to be significantly more inclusive. So in the same way that the question, what role, if any, does emotion have, was double-barreled, I will focus first on what you yourself are supposed to do, and then second, how you can begin to like influence others in some capacity. So what should we do with our emotions? At a minimum, I would encourage you not to squish them down, but to do things like practice breathing and reflexivity techniques that ensure that the emotional occurrence that you are having is not disproportionate in the way that it could influence you. When we talk about grounding techniques, we talk about a focus on the moment, on the present. And there are plenty of instances in which engaging in an argument will immediately cause people's anxiety levels to spike. Your blood pressure is going to go up. Your heart is going to race. Your body is going to tremble in some capacity. It doesn't have to. One of the things that I actually encouraged my public speaking students to do when I taught public speaking was if you're experiencing that kind of dysregulation, take a moment and focus on something else. Get a drink of water and don't make it a quick one. Like actually drink water, focus on it, and then use that to remind your body that it is safe. Grounding techniques are very often ways of minimizing the disproportionate nature of emotion while still allowing the emotion to take place. We also need to think about bodily regulation because our bodies freak out in a way that is not necessarily predictable to us. Uh, I don't know, for example, if you have had an argument with a parent uh, and that created, like, it raised your heckles. Because when you were a child, that kind of argument was not safe. And now, as an adult, it's significantly more safe, intellectually. Like, you know that to be the case. And yet, if you have years and years of baggage that say, this is a danger zone that I am encountering, of course your body's going to respond to that. So taking these moments where we can ground ourselves and think very seriously, not only about the emotion that it's occurring, but also how we can ensure that it doesn't have a disproportionate impact on us, that's the base level. It's not excluding the emotion, but it is making sure that the emotion does not create an untenable circumstance for us. Second, you need to acknowledge that you are not infallible. When you strive to be objective, if you are attempting to minimize, contain, quarantine your emotions, you're probably going to mess that up. And I would say that it is folly to believe that you can engage in an argument encounter totally divorced from the personal stakes that you have in it. The moment I became a parent, I had a new stake in a debate about gun control in the United States. And I can't get rid of that. Like, I'm, I'm going to continue to be a parent until I'm not, at which point a different catastrophe has occurred. And as such, we need to make sure that when we have active emotional investments, we're giving voice to them. We're not trying to quarantine them because to do so would in a large way be lying to ourselves. And that's an acknowledgement that we all cannot be as objective as perhaps we would like. That's not, though, a bug. Honestly, it's a feature because it clarifies for us our commitments, our investments, and the stakes of these given debates. Third, you need to recognize that your emotional expression, it may actually activate a stress response in others. My partner and I, uh, we, we've been together for 14 years. Of course, we've argued. Every partner does. But sometimes we have spirited conversations because, I, I, I mean, this is the third week some of you have seen me. You know I love to talk. Uh, but there's also this moment in which, like, something may be activated and we're saying things off the cuff. Many of us are not going to be polished in a given circumstance, especially if a topic comes up that we genuinely have things to say about. However, it's more than possible that you're actually inadvertently activating stress responses. Maybe in your children. This isn't intentional, but it's still possible. It's also uh, 
possible that within your partner, they can identify moments in which you are upset. And it's possible that being emotionally aroused, heightened in that way, is actually indistinguishable from you being upset until it's clarified, until it's contextualized. And I would say most importantly, if you are in a dominant position in society, specifically meaning if you're like a cis white male, you need to understand that if you raise your voice, people are going to have a bodily response. And that's because very often people have been yelled at, very often unjustifiably, by the old white men in their lives. Now, I'm not saying that you yelled at this person. I'm not saying that you're accountable for it. But I am saying that you need to recognize that in circumstances where you're engaging in something that realistically you don't believe would stress somebody out, you're not intentionally pushing buttons. You are simply expressing in the way that you normally do. It's possible that a combination of things, your gruffness, your body language, the way that you are approaching it could actually activate a stress response in others. And although you are not responsible for how other people interpret your emotional and body cues, that may still have an impact on them. And as such, you should still be conscious of the fact that you can impact others even when it is unintentional. And finally, I think sometimes we get into our heads that if an argument is happening, it has to happen. It has to just, this has to occur right now. And honestly, if you feel as though it's going off the rails, if you're becoming fundamentally emotionally dysregulated, or your partner is, or it's some combination thereof, encouraging individuals to take a moment, take a break, is very, very productive. I don't know if you watched uh, How I Met Your Mother, for example, but one little trick that they talked about, uh, it was between Jason Segal and uh, Allison Hannigan's character, uh, was in the middle of an argument, they would pause and tell each other what they had for lunch that day. Now, you may think, obviously, that's distracting, right? But it, it turns the temperature down. If my daughter is having a tantrum, one of the best ways to get her out of it is to get her to laugh. And I'm not saying that you should do that in every argument, because at some point, you're, you're being a clown. You're just being distracting. You're not actually doing the argument, right? But there are moments in which a brief interruption is sometimes enough to actually allow people that moment to get back to regulate it. There's no shame in it. And frankly, if your conversation partner wants to engage you in good faith, if they want this to be a productive occurrence, and you say, hey, I'm this is becoming a little difficult for me to continue, I'd like a moment. Let's, let's take a moment, let's take five, let's go get some water or something like that. This is totally appropriate. Don't go to bed angry, obviously. I'm not a relationship expert, but that's, I think, good knowledge. Uh, but make sure that you're not barreling through a conversation or an argument for the sake of trying to get it done. These are all things that I fundamentally think if we were to all internalize, people would begin to probably model that behavior, honestly. At the bottom, we can't control other folks, but we can model preferable behavior for them. And in circumstances in which uh, an argument is occurring and we feel like the emotions are causing it to go off the rails, if you adopt these strategies and you encourage not a negation or a relegation of the emotion, but instead in an acknowledgement that they occur and an acknowledgement that specific attributes of them may actually be making this harder, people are going to notice that. They're going to model it back to you in some capacity. And in that way, these internally focused strategies are actually ways of promoting these things in others. This is the last thing that I'll say about individual strategies before pivoting to ways to deal with others. And that is something that I said at the beginning. We are not taught emotional regulation very well in American culture. And part of that has to do with our parents. I'm not coming for any of the parents who are in this room, but I am telling you that it's probable that your parents kind of lost their stuff on you, and as such, you may have lost your stuff on your kid. Like, it happens, right? However, if you generally are attempting to demonstrate emotional regulation to a child, they're actually going to mirror that back to you eventually. It just takes a while, right? One of the most gratifying things about being a parent is continually repeating something for six months and then the child eventually saying it of their own accord.
It's the same principle. If we were to model for others, they will eventually internalize it. And that completes at least a three-week streak of let's treat our conversation partners like toddlers. Uh, don't actually do that. I'm just saying it's analogous. So we've got our own modes of self-regulation. Right, And we have this understanding of emotion that says this has a role in argument and we should not necessarily uh, negate it or exclude it out of the gate. But what happens if another person is coming in a little too hot or things are going off the rails? You are well regulated, but they are not. Well, first, you need to actually give folks space to feel their emotions. This part is going to be hard, right? Because if somebody comes in and they are irate, if you give them space to feel that emotion, you may be the target of that irateness for a period of time. And that sucks. Nobody should honestly have to experience a verbal berating, especially one that is uh, not warranted. However, acknowledging the anger, saying, listen, it seems as though this is very, very upsetting to you. I'm not telling you not to be upset, but let's take a moment, gather ourselves, and consider where that upsetness is coming from. You've come in hot. You're clearly very angry about this. What is actually activating that anger, and what can we do about it? Because, frankly, there's a reason that somebody's angry. If somebody has come in hot, it's not just because they're an ass. It's because something has happened that has given them reason to come in hot. And as such, giving them a moment where they're able to experience that emotion and probably come to their own conclusion about it being a little bit disproportionate, well, you may have solved that particular problem in the argument before it even became a problem. Very often by giving folks the space to experience their emotions and begin to work through them and begin to get regulated, we actually are giving them all the tools and the space that they need. Second, you need to remove your being too emotional from your vocabulary. Like, I normally don't deal in absolutes, but just don't. Like, don't contend that somebody is being too emotional. And if somebody says that to you, I would argue that you shouldn't necessarily tolerate it. There are moments in which you should probably ask if somebody says that to you, what is it precisely that I'm doing that is creating an untenable circumstance for you? What about my emotional portrayal here is unacceptable? Because it's possible that they will not have an answer for you. Very often when people are saying you're being too emotional, they're invoking particular cultural or gendered or racialized standards, even if they're not meaning to. And in doing so, they're attempting to redefine the contours of the conversation. An example to demonstrate this. Uh, my partner has a coworker who is a little bit of a, uh, he's, he's a prickly pear, like we can just call him that. Uh, and this individual has a tendency actually of like emoting very visibly in meetings. And he has periodically taken himself off camera in order to emote more fully. Up until this point, I don't think that we we're actually doing something unacceptable, right? Because sometimes, yes, we're going to emote at work. Like, there are plenty of things that are wildly frustrating about our jobs. And in the moment, it's more than possible that they will induce us to anger or tears or confused laughter or whatever it happens to be. But this individual managed in a conversation where they were very much in the wrong to suggest that the entire team of creative directors, who all happened to be women, they were being too emotional to continue the conversation. This person not only received a very good talking to from HR, uh, but also it's even if this person was not intentionally invoking a kind of misogynistic standard, they very much were attempting to alter the contours of a conversation by invoking emotionality and saying, your displays of what I'm perceiving as emotion are enough to warrant shutting down the conversation. That's what your being too emotional does. It shuts down the conversation. It doesn't matter who's saying it. It doesn't matter who is actually being emotional. It's going to create a framework where the debate is no longer about whatever it was. Now the debate is about whether or not I'm being too emotional. And that does not fundamentally lead to any sort of productive resolution. So 
Yes, I slipped in a self-directed thing. Strike it from your vocabulary. But also, I would encourage you to gently but firmly not allow it in others. Because when other folks are engaged in these kinds of argumentative tactics, they very likely are doing so in good faith. Like, this is not like a character defect that they're displaying, but that does not mean that you have to give space for that. Third, you need to delineate between the kinds of emotional engagement which subvert actual effective engagement. I'm thinking of vitriol, profound dysregulation, anger that causes raised voices, those kinds of things, versus those which actually contribute meaningfully to a conversation. Because talking about emotional investment is productive. It might make us uncomfortable, but that doesn't mean that it's not productive. There are also moments in which the expression of anger is actually entirely valid. If you're, for example, in a supervisory role, uh, or heck, even you're a parent, it's possible that the people who are coming to you are going to communicate anger, and it's not directed at you, and yet you still need to allow them to express that anger, because you just happen to be the person who they're able to talk to. American colleges are incredibly hierarchical. There are so many people above me that I don't know what their names are, what their jobs are. To this day, I don't know what a dean does. And at this point, I'm afraid to ask. Uh, and as such, like, if I'm venting frustration, I might be venting it to my immediate supervisor, my department head, who I genuinely like. She surely knows that my frustration is not actually directed at her. And yet she is the only person in that circumstance who is on the receiving end of it, right? And in an ideal world, I'm being very cordial and I'm explaining to her, I am merely frustrated and I would like to vent for a moment. But it's possible that I didn't have the presence of mind. It's possible that I fumbled that in some capacity. And as such, if your conversation partner is engaged in the exact same ham-fisted behavior that sometimes we will all engage, you need to identify, all right, is the expression of this kind of anger, is the expression of this kind of sadness, is this the thing that will actually cause the arguments to go off the rails? Like, can we truly not pass go if this person is experiencing this emotion? Or can the expression of the emotion actually be a mode of promoting a productive argument? Or giving me a sense of the tangible impacts which matter to this person? Because very often, the emotionality of an appeal it does clarify precisely why a person is going to do or advocate for the things that they do. I have told my students pretty much every semester that they should probably go get vaccinated. They should get vaccinated for COVID-19. Intellectually, I believe this. I believe this as a person who's consumed research. Like, we don't have to have that debate. But at some point, the true reason, the honest-to-God reason why I think that is that for a while, my daughter couldn't be vaccinated. And as such... All I could do was tell you all that the moment you aren't vaccinated is a moment where you're putting a cherubic, perfect child, top five toddlers to ever exist, at risk. Yes, that's an emotional appeal. Yes, of course it is manipulative in a sense, right? Because you look at a cute kid, and of course you're not going to be like, yeah, forget that kid. Like, that, that's not the way that we would respond. And yet, that clearly clarifies, well, why would I be a diehard about vaccines? Why would I tell my family, especially in the height of the pandemic, yeah, we're not going to travel for Thanksgiving if folks are not vaccinated, it's a clarification of underlying values and a clarification of the impact that we have on others. Ultimately, not all emotions are created equal, but many emotions do have a role or a place in argument. And at a minimum, the attempt to regulate them out causes far more trouble than the existence of emotion within argument does. Very often, when folks object to emotion and argument, they object to yelling and screaming and violations of social decorum that realistically are not considered productive. That is a justifiable and understandable approach to the regulation of argument out, or regulation of emotion out of argument. 
but it is not justifiable when there is slippage into an inability for people to allow any emotion to encroach on their decision-making calculus or on the particular appeals that they make. Because ultimately, those things clearly matter, both from an argumentative perspective and from like just a pure human dignity perspective. And as such, I would encourage you to not only strike from your vocabulary that you're being too emotional, but also to hold yourself to a high standard in terms of how you can be regulated, even in circumstances in which, yeah, it is a little bit emotionally fraught, and in doing so, perhaps model that behavior for others. So we are now 75% of the way done. And the final day that we're going to have uh, next week, we're going to talk about structures. Essentially, how broader societal things, like the persistence of white supremacy or the persistence of patriarchy, create problems for people even when they are not directly addressing those power structures. I don't mean to preview too much, but suffice to say, I think that if you're a member of a marginalized community, you're going to have a harder time in an argument. And that's not because of you. It's not because of your conversation partner. It is because of structures, nameless structures, hierarchies, and broader ideologies that have made y'all's life harder. And as such, we will unpack them, we will think about them, and we will think about how to effectively navigate them. Even with starting a little bit late, we have 14 minutes left for questions. Uh, so as you compose, as you think of possible questions, I'm going to get a drink of water. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm very curious about your choice of the word actor. Uh, elaborate. During the outset of the books, if you show that. Um, yeah, the, uh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> The Shapiro book? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I'm not actually thinking about actor as like a performative thing. I'm thinking about actor as like an individual who has agency in some capacity. So like if I talk about like a governmental actor, I'm talking about maybe an institution like the Environmental Protection Agency or like the head of the EPA or something along those lines. I prefer to use actor when I'm referring to these folks, because Shapiro does not actually have a, he doesn't have a categorization that works very well. He's a UCLA lawyer. He's a political commentator. He's written books. He's got a podcast. He does a bunch of stuff. And yeah, okay, we could call him like a pundit, or we could call him, I don't know, a, a, a thinker or something. Like, I don't feel like there's a good, like, generic term for folks who are engaged in the process of, like, social sense-making and discourse. So, actor is the generic, nondescript term that I prefer to use. But justifiable, like, yeah, like, what, what do we actually mean by that? So, thank you. Does that kind of clarify? It? Cool, absolutely. Did you have a question, sir, or just a hand on the head? Fair enough. <laughs> Other questions? Thoughts? Uh, yes? So you keep um, comparing how we're supposed to talk to each other to talking to a toddler. But yes. You instead say that we should talk to toddlers the way we um, talk, because you're, you're trying to um, have a conversation with your toddler as well, or an argument. And so would you, instead of saying we're supposed to talk to other people like toddlers, we're supposed to talk to toddlers like other people like, using the same... Um, good faith persuasion techniques and listening and um, being um, persuaded the same way? So I would definitely say that. Um, I think that sometimes when I'm saying we should like talk to them as a toddler, in my head I'm thinking about the way that I try to talk to my toddler, which is as a human being. Um, and I'm not saying that other folks do not treat their children as human beings. It's much more that we very often do not assume that a three-year-old, a four-year-old, a five-year-old is capable of understanding logic or that the things that they do are unmoored from reality. Which, I mean, there's some truth to that, like, at, at the bottom, in some ways. Like, yes, they're four. This thing that seems like it's the worst thing that's ever happened to them, it might genuinely be the worst thing that ever happened to them. Like, that's within the realm of possibility. But when we 
think about essentially being kind, being gentle, uh, allowing for the possibility of mistakes, and also attempting to genuinely listen to each other, that sounds so very basic. Like, it sounds like the very basic extension of humanity that we would always want and expect. And yet, it seems easiest to me sometimes to frame that as a person who knows better engaging a person who maybe is relatively new to the world. So, yes, uh, a possible takeaway from this particular lecture is when you are engaging with toddlers, they are smart, they are observant, uh, they are truly functioning human beings, uh, you're, they just need help. They need a lot of help, actually. Um, so be charitable, be reasonable, and yes, be kind to each other. Any question? Now, I heard that differently. What I heard you saying when you were talking about the toddler was providing a model and an example from which to learn. Yeah, which is also true. We should do that for each other, right? Like, so I'm a first-generation college student. I was the first in my family to get a BA or any other form of a degree. And as such, I have no earthly idea how professionally I'm supposed to be a professor. Like, I, I didn't have a good sense of it, right? And I learned by modeling other people. And very fortunately, I had a wide range of like behaviors and attributes that I could pick from. But if I went to a PhD program or the department at the University of Louisville was staffed primarily with people who modeled bad behavior, even as an adult, even as a thinking person who is more than capable of identifying bad behavior, I would almost certainly pick up those tendencies. Because, and I don't mean this uncharitably, we imitate. We emulate, we capture from other folks the things that we like or that we perceive to work. Sometimes it's because it's an esteem thing, sometimes it's because there are genuine stakes attached to that performance, uh, and that might mean that if we model particular things, the people around us might pick up on it. I, I don't think necessarily, like, that's an instance where we're not trying to denigrate the intelligence of those around us. It's merely identifying a parallel between, like, literal teaching the teaching of children how to exist in the world and be humans, we can also do that for each other. Because none of us really know all that much at the end of the day. Like, we're all making it up as we go. Uh, and as such, it makes sense for us to not only model good behavior, but also look to that behavior in others. It's a good question. Yes? Mm -hmm. When you say that it doesn't help, you mean that you've done that and emotions are still running hot? So that is a moment in which that's, that's data. That's like something that we can identify and understand. If you experience an event and it gets you so riled that it takes multiple days to shake it, like there are plenty of emotions like that. Grief is a great example, where like grief is not something you experience acutely and then move on. It comes in waves and it does all manner of things. So if this is the kind of thing where you or your conversation partner or both of you are unable to like shake the heatedness, that's an index of something deeper. That is suggesting that there is something going on in either the way that you're conducting the conversation or the topic itself that is incredibly, incredibly difficult for folks to experience and to talk about. So I would say that that's not, that's not like a problem. That's not like something that you need to solve. It's much more an index of, okay, there is something going on and it's maybe not going to be solved by like general argument tactics. It's actually going to be solved by looking inward or by having conversations with other folks. Does that kind of get at it? No, of course. I, I hear you though, right? Because like it is a very high standard to hold for ourselves that we would be able to like have a heated conversation, take a moment, go get a cupcake, and then come back and like continue it. That, do, that does not seem like normal human behavior. And yet, sometimes that's enough, right? Taking that moment, allowing yourself just 
the single moment where people are not, like their eyes are not on you and you can begin to figure out and unpack some of your emotions and specifically the things which are like activating your fight or flight response, that might be enough to keep going. But if your fight or flight response is still activated, if you still are profoundly anxious about this thing, that's an index of something deeper. We got to figure that out. Tony, you had a question. No, you're fine. Right. Finish the thing, yeah. So sometimes in politics, we talk about the need for not an impartial, but like a good third-party actor to come in and like kind of broker a deal. And perhaps the most pressing for a lot of folks is like the navigation of a relationship being severed. Because... If you do not have, like, all of the trappings of marriage, essentially you're not, like, entangled with another person, you are merely severing a relationship, you're probably not going to need a mediator. But a mediator seems to be appropriate in those contexts because it is possible that neither party can actually act in such a way that is not motivated by a little bit of spite or a little bit of malice or a little bit of hurt or something along those lines. And I think that the circumstance in which one would decide to get a moderator uh, or a mediator, I'm sorry, is the circumstance in which one would say, I am not positive that we are going to be able to reach any meaningful resolution on this thing that absolutely has to be resolved absent an additional party who can keep us on the rails. Because sometimes a mediator is not actually required for you, you've got it under control, but you know that your partner is going to drag their feet. And in the context of like a divorce proceeding, they're legally able to do that. At times, at circumstances in which a person's intransigence or an unwillingness to engage in good faith argument precludes that argument from taking place, you need to locate the way to resolve that argument that does not require them. I'm not saying you should always go around people, but I am saying that in circumstances where it is very clear that a person is unwilling to engage you and clearly there's some sort of emotional or affective attachment that goes with that, I think that that's a circumstance for a mediator. And let's, let's cut to the end of the page, right? If you engage in some sort of egregious action in your relationship, if you engage in infidelity or like, I don't know, financial fraud or something along those lines, it's not realistic to expect your conversation partner to just be like, okay, yes, that's ha that happened. Let's talk about path forward. It's an impossible standard. So a mediator is a way to, I think, solve that problem in a sense. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so my question is, uh, you come from a fluid communication background. Yeah. I'm curious if you've seen anything in recent years about this union husband that has become really fascinating or new or has shifted or something that has come has, has been flowed to the end of the so there is an ebb and a flow to it. There are, I think, three things that I would draw your attention to, which are somewhat unique to our current political movement. Uh, some of them are evolutions, but they are kind of like it's not in your head. It has become different. Uh, the first is outrage journalism. I think that previously, like AM radio, Rush Limbaugh, yeah, he's yelling about all manner of things. But Rush Limbaugh was like, he was the exception, not the rule. And now when we talk about Shapiro and Maddow and Hayes and really all of the talking heads, there is a degree of incredulity and outrage in their voice. And it's possible that that is like a justifiable response to the ratcheting stakes of U.S. politics, but it's also probable that it's a performance, with which an amount of politicians have already pointed out. But the second part is that we, things are genuinely upsetting in a lot of different ways. Uh, the fact that uh, President Obama literally cried publicly after Sandy Hook, in many ways that was a turning point, right? Because there was always an emotional argument in incumbent in like parenthood and why we need to protect vulnerable populations and all of that. But when we now suddenly have a moment where children are literally being snatched from the earth, 
we've, we've got some problems. And of course, we're going to have people who are bringing justifiably emotions into the conversation. And then the third is police brutality. There have been circumstances. Uh, this occurred, I believe, in response to, it was either George Floyd or, now I've forgotten how sad is that, the, the name of the individual in New York, I think it might have been Eric Gardner, uh, where their family was like, uh, yeah, we're not accepting apologies at this time. We're not accepting any of this. We are pissed. And frankly, justifiable, at least for some folks, right? Anger is a justifiable response to systemic injustice. And very often, we don't allow for the expression of it. So I think that sometimes these are positive trends, but they also present a political problem. What am I supposed to do with anger? Like, what am I supposed to do with grief? And I don't mean that uncharitably. I mean, genuinely, how am I supposed to figure these things in our modern political moment? And that really is the difficulty. So to recap, it's not in your head. It has happened significantly. Part of it is a continuation of outrage journalism. The other part of it is there is a genuine change to the way that legislation, to the way that people respond to it. And frankly, that has invited space for emotion, justifiable space. We are at 8 o'clock. I appreciate you all, and I hope to see you next week where we will talk about structures. <laughs>